Welcome to lecture 26. So, today we will start the lambda calculus proper. All right. So, let me just briefly recap the whole idea of the lambda calculus was to look upon functions as first class objects to be able to say what kind of a value a function is, to look upon function spaces themselves as sets of points to give unnamed functions a characterization and which essentially me meant that you have to be able to treat functions and also more importantly to give a fundamental theory of computation. Um, and uh, the parallel with sets was something I pointed out that in when it comes to mathematics you consider sets to be the fundamental object, you reformulate the they reformulated the whole of mathematics so that everything depended on just set theory and set theory itself was axiomatized in first order logic. Um, similarly, Church attempted uh, using functions, the concept of a function as uh, the fundamental object of computation and uh, you could also define sets as functions by, uh, through the membership predicate. And uh, as I said, I mean there is a lot of, there is a lot about the membership predicate which looks like, uh, which can be made to look like function application, if you try hard enough that is. Uh, and uh, the main important thing about function application is that uh, you are really doing syntactic substitutions and it is symbolic, it is totally symbolic. So, even a child an animal or a machine could possibly do it. Uh, so, so, the, so when it comes to uh, and the, so the lambda abstraction so to speak or the lambda calculus emphasizes the difference between functions, function definitions where functions are treated as objects and application of functions, the result of applying a function to a value object which might be either concrete or symbolic, right. So, we will start with the syntax of the pure calculus. So, the lambda calculus is important for one, one very uh, is important because firstly it can be regarded as the mother of all programming languages especially the functional programming languages. It was the first function, first programming language with a cleanly defined syntax and semantics and it was never implemented till very recently. Yeah, uh, so the pure calculus, I will first look at the pure calculus. So, you as in the case of any logical theory you assume a countably infinite set of variable symbols given to you and you have nothing else right everything else has to come from the lambda uh, from the lambda calculus itself so you don't have any predefined sets of objects unless you are applying the lambda calculus to some existing domain so and then the the grammar is actually very simple so so any variable symbol is a lambda term and I have the concept of a lambda abstraction which contains a binding occurrence of a variable and a, a lambda term and uh, since the, the, the uh, so I am trying to maintain the analogy with sets as far as possible. And then uh, so and then within uh, for this binding occurrence there is a certain scope defined by the body of the lambda term. So, anything of this form is a lambda term and if you have two lambda terms, the application of one lambda term on to the other uh, enclosed in parenthesis is also a lambda term, right. So, so it is a simple syntax with essentially just two constructs. And uh, as usual, we could define the notions of free variables and bound variables. Uh, so, uh, 
for the lambda term x, x is the only free variable for the lambda term, which I will call this lambda x l. Okay. Uh, I do not really like uh, Church's original notation, so though that is what you will find in most textbooks. Uh, I like this analogy with sets. So, I will use this notation. So, I, what I will call it lambda x l and this has all variables that occur in occur free in l except x as the free variables. And in a lambda application, uh, the free variables are the free variables of each of the constituents, where loosely speaking this lambda term l is like an operator applied on an operand. However, they are both lambda terms. Since you have nothing, you are starting essentially from nothing except variables, you really cannot distinguish between what is a function and what is a value. So, it is ve it's very general in the sense that well functions might be applied to functions, some of them might be meaningless, some of them might be meaningful, but if you allow this facility then you also get higher order functions. right? So, I will use capital lambda, uh, uh, I am using blue here though uh, which is against my convention to use it to use for a programming language for a very simple reason that most beginners find the lambda calculus very abstract. So, uh, so I thought we should use blue for that. Anyway, uh, the, the set capital lambda is the set of all lambda terms and the set of all closed lambda terms that means, uh, those lambda terms which have no free variables is the set of combinators. Yeah. And uh, so, we have defined the syntax, now let us define the semantics. So, uh, the semantics really is through a notion called beta reduction. Uh, so, a beta reduction has this as the primary axiom. If you have a lambda term which is of the syntactic form, that is it is a lambda abstraction applied to another lambda term, then the result of this application is whatever is in green is a, is a substitution. The whole point is that this whatever is in green is not part of the lambda calculus language. But if you remember, uh, I mean the result of this application I have to somehow express in some form in terms of L and M. And what I claim is that the result of this application is you take the pattern of L and take all free occurrences of x, remove those free occurrences of x from that pattern and substitute the pattern copies of the pattern m. Okay, so, this is a syntactic substitution which literally does a pattern matching and replacement. Okay. So, so this, this thing in green braces, this operation in green braces is meta syntactic. I mean it is at a level of abstraction above the syntax of the lambda calculus. right? So, you take this pattern L, look at all free occurrences of x in it and replace all those single string x patterns by entire patterns m, copies of the pattern m. Right? So, that is really what this and this is called a beta reduction. This such a such a pattern which consists of a lambda abstraction applied to another lambda term okay is called a beta redex right and uh, uh, they have some fairly complicated names for all these things but let's let's just look at beta redexes and then after that uh, you have to uh, structurally close all these on in contexts so if m goes on a beta reduction to n, then L applied to m goes on a beta reduction to L applied to n. 
So, what I am what it means is I mean uh, it is possible that since I said that the what what looks like the operand of an to an operator even though I mean that, so that itself might be an expression which is capable of being reduced right. So, if that is capable of being reduced in one step to another expression n then the result of this application reduces to the result of this application reduces to this application right. Similarly, it is possible that the operator itself the so called operator itself is capable of being reduced without actually applying it to uh, an operand. So, if L itself can go in a 1 beta step to n then the result of applying L to m moves in a, in a single beta step to n applied to m. Yeah. And lastly of course, uh, if you have a lambda abstraction, the body of the lambda abstraction could be quite complex and might be capable of being, reduction, uh, being reduced. For example, it might contain another abstraction applied to some application and so it is capable of, I mean after all this is just a lambda term. So, this lambda term could itself be an application, right. So, if L could reduce in one step to m, then this abstraction reduces to this abstraction. Okay, so so these uh, the rules beta two to beta four actually just close the notion of reduction to uh, to take care of all syntactic contexts. So the main rule is really beta one, yeah, which gives a one step reduction. Now, as in the case of our other operational semantics, we could actually define many step beta reductions. Okay. So, um, and what uh, what actually Church did was that he actually formalized all these also as rules. So, a many step beta reduction which we have mostly taken for granted as a reflexive transitive closure of this is really this. I mean this and these three rules just give you the reflexive transitive closure. So, for example, if L is capable of being reduced in one step to m, then L is capable of being reduced in 0 or more steps to m. The reflexive closure just says that L can be reduced in 0 or more steps to L itself and the transitivity just says that if L can get reduced to m in 0 or more steps and m can get reduced to n in 0 or more steps then L can get reduced to n in 0 or more steps, right. What is the term strong here? Ah, I will talk about uh, weak uh, reductions, but loosely speaking a weak reduction uh, a, beat, a weak uh, one step beta reduction is something that does not have beta 4. So, if you just consider the rules beta 1, beta 2 to beta 3, then then what you are saying implicitly is that you cannot reduce, you cannot do any reductions inside a lambda abstraction. Okay. So, what it means is that unless this abstraction gets applied to something and therefore, this x moves out and inside application cannot be reduced. Okay, we will see the reason for those things uh, later. Okay. <coughs> right. So, and uh, what we could also do is, for example, we could uh, we could look at an equality generated by a beta reduction. Right. So, for example, you could take this symmetric transitive relation generated by the many step beta reduction, many of course include 0 uh, and uh, what is the meaning of generated by this? Uh, well, if L goes in 0 or more steps to m, then L is beta equal to m. 
Uh, notice that this equality is uh, not the same as syntactic identity, it is something that will contain syntactic identity because L can go in 0 or more steps to L itself and so L is beta equal to L itself. Okay. So, it is it's slightly, it is weaker than syntactic identity and if L is beta equal to M, then M is beta equal to L. And if L is beta equal to M and M is beta equal to N, then L is beta equal to N. Right. So, this is the equality relation generated by the many step beta reduction. And what it means is that um, and this equality is actually very much uh, very much like the normal equality that we might think of in our algebraic computations. I mean these things are all um, uh, these things are all motivated by similar notions of computation and considerations which come from algebra. Right. So, if you take the simplification of a complicated algebraic expression, you go through a process of reduction okay, using some rules or some theorems that you already have. And in each case, the step that you get after a reduction is equal to the step that you had before. Okay, so, that is how you simplify and get maybe a single value or a, an, a, a simple expression right. Uh, and uh, symbolic uh, computations also use the same thing, it does not matter whether it is values or symbols, you still you go through the same forms of reduction except, uh, okay. so, so these things are more, so all these concepts really come from uh, your school algebra if you like. I mean, Standard question number 1 after having studied a plus b the whole square is equal to a square plus 2 a b plus b square. Question number 1 what is 99 square or a minus b the whole square is equal to a square minus 2 a b plus b square. Question number 1 what is 101 the whole square what is uh, 99 the whole square and then you go through a process of reduction step by step reduction and that reduction has an equality that is already generated by the reflexive transitive closure of the notion of reduction. And reduction is important in simplification is one directional. Okay. You write 99 as 100 minus 1 which is actually an expansion, it is not uh, really a reduction. Uh, but then that your school teachers do not know anyway that they are actually ex you are actually expected to expand before you reduce uh, in a different way. Right? I mean after all what is to prevent you from just multiplying 99 and 99. Uh, in your normal fashion and getting the square. But the whole point of that exercise was presumably to test whether you understood how to apply the formula a minus b the whole square. So, so that you go through a process of expansion and then you go through reductions okay, where you apply these formulas. These formulas, the application of these formulas is like rules, very much like the beta rules. Okay. Anyway, we look at we look at that. So, this is the pure calculus, and the whole idea of having a pure calculus is that it should be applicable to any other discipline. I mean, so it should be completely independent of and applicable to any other discipline which uses functions. Okay. So, every functional programming language can actually be thought of as just an applied version of the lambda calculus. And so, well, let us look at the applied lambda calculus and see how this is, how the pure version is really distinct from the applied version. So, as far as we are concerned from the, from the standpoint of the lambda calculus itself, the applied calculus is really nothing more than the pure calculus with a new production that which which consists of a collection of finite constant symbols 
and noting the fact that you are doing all this from nothing, I mean you do not have the distinction between values and functions, functions of functions and functions and so on and so forth. These constant symbols could be either values of the underlying domain of application or they could be operators on their underlying domain of application, right. Now, if they, if they are operators in the underlying domain of application, then uh, what it means is that you also have your own reduction rules for that particular domain, right. So, so the applied calculus is, so this is how you would apply to, apply the lambda calculus to any other uh, domain which consists of values, functions, whatever. I mean, so in, in, in general to any other kind of uh, algebraic domain if you like, I mean you should somehow convert the domain into some form of an algebra, uh, which is not very difficult to do if you have the willpower. So, um, so what it means is that, so we will regard these, we will regard all the constant symbols, uh, so these constant symbols are not just the values in the underlying domain. They are, they include also the operators and the functions that you have predefined in that algebra, which have their own forms of reductions, okay. Very often you have equations which do the reduction, like for example, the, the distributive property on natural numbers. So, if you have something like A star B plus A star C, then there is a reduction step which is A star B plus C or the other way could also be a reduction step. I mean the algebraic equations give you two kinds of reductions if you like, where reduction is only a name, sometimes the reduction can be an expansion. But then it is also natural that in a lot of your trigonometry in school, you must have realized that it was, it would have been necessary to expand something before reducing it. So, reduction is a general term uh, to denote some goal oriented activity towards some simplifying form you know which cannot be simplified any further. In the process actu the, the actual strings may actually expand, but you know you do not worry about that. If they get you to your goal, then it is a reduction. I mean there is there is nothing else to be said about it, yeah. So, so now, uh, so what are meanings in an, um, so we will we'll look at an, an application. So, so the mean, uh, so what is the notion of a meaning now? Uh, in an, in any expression language, you would say that the meaning of an expression is the value that it somehow reduces to. I mean, so you have some complicated arithmetic expression, then you would say that the value it reduces to is the meaning, right? So, right? Okay. So now let's look at an application. Uh, I'll I'll tell you about the meanings uh, of. Uh, the lambda terms also, but before that let us look at an application and the simple application that I have in mind is, is the piano arithmetic. Now, what I can do with piano arithmetic is that I actually the if you look at the naturals they are messy stuff in the sense that uh, uh, there are an infinite number of symbols if you like you know and we do not want that I and mean, it is horrible to deal with infinite symbols. Uh, so, you want, so what we will do is we will simplify the naturals into a, a grammar of this form, yeah. So, there are only two symbols, uh, whatever is in light brown or ochre is the symbol of the natural, the natural number is being completely down to earth. Uh, are brown in color, yeah. So, uh, uh, so 0 is a natural number and if m is a natural number, then m prime which actually denotes the successor of m is also a natural number. I mean this is, this is what Piano said at the turn of the century and we have no reason to doubt him, right. Uh, uh, so, so the two constant symbols here are 0 and this prime. Okay, which well you can look upon it as either an operator like the successor operator 
or more more specifically in the case of a language you can look upon it as a constructor which allows you to construct uh, arbitrary elements of a language. So, the natural numbers here are just a language. So, an arbitrary natural number was is going to be 0 followed by a number of prime symbols. Uh, I am re I'm using a postfix notation which is quite usual. Um, and what happens is of course, that this whole thing is tedious. So, you might define two more constant symbols. Okay. So, these two constant symbols might be addition and multiplication. And what you have the moment you define these two constant symbols is that uh, and I am using a prefix notation here. So, what you have is a reduction rule, a new form a one step n reduction rule on the piano, on piano arithmetic. Remember that all this is completely different from the lambda calculus, from the pure lambda calculus. It has got no relationship at all. It has got relationship to a reality of counting maybe, but that is that is about it. So, uh, so, what you do is you define these constant symbols by means of reduction rules. So, I require two reduction rules for let us say addition and one is just says that the sum of m and 0 is m and the other says that the sum of m and the successor of n is the sum of the successor of m and n. Yeah, uh, and what and uh, it's it, it's actually a reduction rule. I mean, it looks like it neither expands nor reduces, but actually it's a reduction rule because eventually you'll get all the primes from here to here, and you'll get a zero there, and so then you'll get a value. So similarly, the product of m and zero is zero, and the product of m and successor of n is the sum of this looks like an expansion rule, but it is actually a reduction rule. Yeah? So, this product of m and n prime is just the sum of the product of m and n and m. Right? So, it looks like an expansive rule, but it is actually a reduction rule we will see that. So, just as we have uh, one step beta reductions, we have one step piano reductions. Okay. And remember you are starting from the void, there is nothing and you have defined the naturals out of sheer genius. And now the question is when you have nothing, what is the meaning <coughs> of an expression in piano arithmetic? So, from nothing you have defined the language of piano arithmetic. And now it is a language, so it requires to have a meaning and now the question is what is the meaning of piano arithmetic, assuming that there is nothing else in the universe. The only alternative is that the meaning of piano arithmetic has to be found within piano arithmetic itself. Right? So, what we will say and this is in fact what we do in our school, I mean it will be, it'll be amazed, you will be amazed how much of these things go back to your elementary education. So, the meaning of an expression in piano arithmetic is just the representation of a number using only the two constructors in the language. So, you do this one step piano reductions, by the way the piano reductions is a, not a standard name, I have just invented it. But uh, but the whole point is that you do those reductions defined till you have a string which which is a string of the original language of uh, piano arithmetic. So, which means that it can only consist of the constant symbol 0 and prime according to the rules of the grammar. Right? And what you declare when you have nothing and you have you are forced to give a meaning you declare that the meaning of a, a complicated expression in piano arithmetic uh, which has possibly plus and star also in it is just what it reduces to eventually till no further reductions are possible. And when no further reductions are possible 
what it means is that the only reductions rules you have are for plus and star. So, when no further reductions are possible, what it means is that you should have an element of this language, which means 0 followed by some primes, right. So, that is the notion of meaning, right. So, similarly, in the lambda calculus, Similarly, in the lambda calculus, again you are starting from the void. So, the meaning of a pure lambda term is a lambda term that contains no more beta red x's. So, assume that you have got some lambda term. So, if you take a lambda term which is not itself a beta red x and does not contain any beta red x's in it, then what you declare is that its meaning is itself and there is no point going further for a meaning. Yeah. So, so the meaning of a pure lambda term is just a lambda term obtained after sufficient number of beta reductions such that it contains no more beta red x's anywhere. So, if it is a string that, con that, is, that contains absolutely no more beta red x's which means it contains no more applications if you if you recollect let me recollect it for you. Yeah. So, this is a beta red x. So, if it contains no more subterms of this form, then you just claim that you have reached the absolute end. I mean, there is no more beta reduction possible, and that is the meaning of the original lambda term. And during the process of reduction of course, you have also generated the equality relation. So, the final lambda term that you get is equal is beta equal to the original lambda term that you started out with right. Okay. So, let us just quickly go and similarly, if you take an applied lambda term let us assume that we are applying the pure calculus, uh, we are taking an applied lambda calculus in which uh, the constant symbols are the symbols of piano arithmetic. So, that means we have taken the language of lambda and we have taken the language of piano arithmetic. Okay. So, the in the so in the syntax of the applied lambda calculus So, in the syntax of the applied lambda calculus, this C, uh, well, good. anyway, in the syntax of the applied lambda calculus. You can replace those constants essentially by all the possible expressions of the uh, uh, piano arithmetic. I mean, so you can append the two languages so that they can intermingle, right? Anyway, let's let's take these notions of reductions quite seriously. Uh, so, just to get you familiar with piano arithmetic. Uh, the notion of reductions in piano arithmetic let us let us do a simple example uh, using the the rules that we have. So, here is here is a simple example which and uh, for the benefit of those who are not automatons I am giving an interpretation of this expression on the right hand side. So, essentially assume that you have to calculate 2 star 2 plus 1. Uh, so, which in our language of piano arithmetic. Uh, remember that the moment you add those two new constants, you are also extending the language, uh, you are also extending the language by those by those two constants, right. I mean by, by expressions involving those two constants, right. So, what you are essentially saying is that the new language after having added these constants is of the form uh, firstly, firstly you have this m which which is of this form 
Secondly, you have an expression after having ad added this these two language uh, these two uh, constants, you have an expression language E which actually allows any member of this original language and all expressions of the form this and this. Right? And now you add this expression language also to the pure lambda calculus right? and then you get an applied lambda calculus. Right. So, uh, in my original definition uh, syntax of the applied lambda calculus, I actually did not uh, did not stick to this format, I just gave an extra production for a C you could replace that C by E. Okay. The reason for using that C is rather pedantic, but actually that was correct, but let us replace it by E. In the applied lambda calculus syntax, replace that production by E, where E is an expression of the uh, application. Right? So, uh, now, now let us look at a pure piano arithmetic example. So, if you have if you have something like this, then by the reduction rule for uh, by the reduction rule for uh, multiplication, you have that this is actually going to be this. Uh, so whatever is underlined in black is the redex in piano arithmetic. So it's capable of being reduced. Okay, and since we are following a prefix notation, our order of computation all that is implicit, I do not I don't want to go into specifying the orders of computation and so on and so forth, but we will assume that norm, it is normal uh, prefix form and so the computation will go in from an innermost operator first right, to the outermost operator. So, this is a read x in piano arithmetic and so this gives me this portion. Right. So, remember that star m n prime is equal to plus star m n m again right piano rule piano reductions piano reductions so star uh, star m n prime reduces to plus star m n m right so so this is how this reduction goes and uh, this which is equivalent to actually saying that 2 multiplied by the successor of 1 is equal to 2 multiplied by 1 uh, plus 2. right? Uh, so, you can follow this uh, the right hand side to see the meaning. So, again you, uh, applying the same rule you get that 2 multiplied by 1 is actually equal to uh, 2 multiplied by 0 plus 2 right? uh, and 2 multiplied by 0 by the first uh, by the basis rule is going to give me 0. So, this reduces this reduces to there is something wrong with this is there it is right. Yeah. So, uh, uh, yes, yes here, here it reduced to this 0 and then there is this now this beta red x. Now, I use the addition rules the addition rule says that despite whatever m might be, if n is a successor of something, if this is a successor of n, then you take the addition of the successor of m with n. So, this, this piano reduction gives me the successor of 0 and essentially the predecessor of this and a further piano reduction gives me this and uh, then of course, this is the base case of the addition operation. So, it gives me just this uh, plus m 0 reduces to m right and uh, uh, th then I have to take tackle this new plus here is a piano reduction which gives me this and then going on in that fashion uh, I get I get this for example, this beta, uh, this reduction yields this, which is equivalent to essentially 4 plus 0 plus 1 
and then this reduction actually is this itself and so now I tackle this reduction which is this which is again the basis and which yields this and after a desperate number of computations we have actually decided that 2 multiplied by 2 and with incremented by 1 is actually equal to 5 right. But the whole point is if you look at all this they are all symbolic reductions right. So, let us look at an example of a reduction in the pure cal a pure lambda calculus and it is going to be very very much like this it is purely remember that having defined the language of piano arithmetic and the expressions in the language we are what we have done is we have just applied the reduction rules in a pure syntactic substitution do not look at this right hand side look at only this side. So, it is pure symbol substitution which satisfies according to the rules of reduction right and that is really what church considered the basis of all computation function application and reduction right. So, if let us look at this pure lambda term. Uh, so, here now you will understand why I use the blue color for the syntax of the lambda calculus you could interpret piano arithmetic very easily, but you are not going to be able to interpret this very easily yeah. So, uh, look at this. So, I have for your uh, convenience I have marked out all the relevant portion. So, this term is lambda x, lambda y, lambda z each time new scopes and this term here is x applied to z okay, which is enclosed in parenthesis and whatever this object might be is applied to this object which is y applied to z itself okay. and uh, since it is an application I have enclosed it in parenthesis and then I close all the brackets right. So, it is it is a nested scoping where the body itself is an application of essentially unspecified symbols right. So, uh, so it is it is an application applied to another application the body itself is an application applied to another application and now this entire now this is this whole thing is a lambda abstraction the whole thing is applied to this lambda term which is which is just uh, which is which is just something very simple for convenience uh, yeah. So, it is uh, lambda u lambda v u itself. Right. So, now what do you do? How do you do a beta reduction? You scan the string from left to right till you encounter consecutive occurrences of open parenthesis and left square bracket. Then you know you have a beta reduction possible there. Go to the matching square bracket and look for the operand after that and the closing square parenthesis. Now, your beta reduction says that once you identified what is the bound variable here and what is the term that is going to be applied that is going to be act that is going to act as the operator operant. You take the body this entire body and replace all free occurrences of this x in this body if you look at this body in isolation then x is actually not bound anymore it is free replace all free occurrences of x by this term. So, I have marked out there is a single free occurrence of x here and that x is going to be throughout replaced by this. So, uh, what you see in green is the effect of the substitution right. So, what I have done is I replaced this x by this entire operand and then what I have is now I now this this application of x to z looked rather abstruse I mean x was not necessarily a lambda abstraction ok. You cannot apply unless I mean you cannot expect to get anywhere with an application unless there is a lambda abstraction as an operator 
but now this substitution has created a new beta red x by itself. Yeah? So, now scanning from left to right in fact you get this beta red x again I have marked in red. So, what now what has happened is that this application is actually going to be over this lambda abstraction. So, all free occurrences of z all free occurrences of u are going to be systematically replaced by z and this pair of parentheses goes away this abstraction also goes away right. So, that yields this right. Now, this thing now this thing was even more abstruse because you are performing an application here and now you automatically have that this term y applied to z is actually an operand of this lambda abstraction and therefore, is capable of being a beta red x is capable and therefore, this body is capable of being reduced right. So, which means now you take this you take this beta red x, replace all free occurrences of v within the scope of v by y applied to z. And is this z the same as this z? God alone knows, but I, oh, the whole point is I do not care at this point at least. Okay. Now, the of course, there are no free occurrences of v here. And so, the result of this application is just that I get back z. Right? So, th so, and this again is purely symbolic. Right? Now, we can we could quickly go through our we could quickly go through this. Supposing I mixed the lambda calculus with piano arithmetic. There is no tutorial today. Okay. So, if, if I mix the lambda calculus with piano arithmetic, what do I get? I actually apply the uh, okay. I have chosen to apply the beta rules first. So, I have this red x and I follow the usual practice and I replace there are two free occurrences of x here. So, I replace them by this entire term okay. and uh, I get this rather colorful object. I have always thought of computations as being very colorful, otherwise, they are confusing. So, um, and uh, the point is that now I have chosen this orange red x here. I could have equally well chosen uh, this pink red x, okay, but I have chosen this orange red x and which means I replace all free occurrences of y of u within this by y and I get this. Now, of course, I could have instead of trying to find a beta red x, I could have even done a piano reduction here. Okay, but I decided not to do it. I could have equally well chosen this reduction and try to reduce it some point. So, and when I perform this, uh, that means when I perform this beta red x, all free occurrences of u in this body are going to be replaced by plus y 0 double prime. I get this, and then now I have a lambda abstraction in which there are no more beta red x's, but there are piano red x's. So, I continue with the piano reductions. Yeah. So, I do the piano reductions as, as I have illustrated before and I finally get this mixed lambda piano term, a symbolic term. Remember that y was not specified anywhere. I get a pure, I just say that the result of this is lambda y fourth successor of y. Yeah, but I could have chosen these alternate reductions anytime I wanted. I could have intermingled beta reductions with piano reductions, and believe it or not, you would have got the same result. <laughs>